So good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, lots of good stuff took place yesterday, and I want to offer a quick retrospective on that uh, before we dive into a bunch of new material for today. Um, <clears throat> so yesterday covered a lot of ground. Um, we had some foundational discussion of uh, the modeling process. Um, with elements common to all dynamic modeling traditions, but also some more uh, more focused in addressing agent-based modeling in the first uh, lecture. Um, and we then went on and went to add in some components of networks into uh, an agent-based model that we've been building up with uh, heart disease and smoking. And uh, we integrated uh, networks there to capture elements of uh, peer influence on uh, smoking initiation. Um, next, uh, in the afternoon, uh, we spent a bunch of time uh, on adding to models uh, some representation of uh, data collection processes where we could do reporting from those models, um, reporting that, that characterized uh, and summarized the set, uh, the state of the population in various, uh, along various metrics. Uh, so we are summarizing prevalences, we are summarizing uh, Counts of people and certain subdivisions of the population, uh, et cetera. And uh, we also incorporated an open population, a population of individuals um, was no longer just a cohort. We had uh, people dying and they, they had different mortality risks from, uh, from heart disease and, and not heart disease. I'd like to, to just riff on a couple of elements of yesterday's uh, discussions. Um, and specifically, I wanted to, to hit on some of those uh, components from our first um, open discussion, this, this discussion of, uh, of uh, modeling process. And I wanted to link it in with some material I actually covered uh, later. So, in the modeling process, I mentioned um, that uh, it is uh, it is characterized by a number of, of basic um, features, and uh, it is it has some structure to it. Um, it naturally proceeds um, uh, when first encountered in a certain staging, but it also has iterative components. It's components where, because modeling is learning. Uh, as we learn, as stakeholder needs change, as the policy situation changes, so the availability of certain interventions, as new issues come to the fore, uh, we commonly have to go back to earlier stages of the process and rethink some of the divisions. Some of that occurs from learning alone. We, we learn by adding components into the model that some elements are really important and we decide we really need to spend more time representing them in detail. Or maybe we add some components to the model and it really engages stakeholder imagination and they'd like us to elaborate it in a certain direction to capture um, new types of interventions or policy options or program design uh, that they are considering or they put more, um, more on the table in terms of requests for outcomes uh, they're interested in examining for the model. Whatever it is, it's common, whatever the reason, it's common for us to go back and sometimes go back to the point of, of uh, changing model formulation. Um, that's very common, but sometimes uh, changing the scoping of the model, what's included uh, and what's not. And in that first lecture, I introduced a threefold division 
that's of fundamental importance in modeling and dynamic modeling. And it's between things that are endogenous, exogenous, and ignored. The first two categories, endogenous and exogenous, are represented in the model. Both of them appear in some form in the model. But endogenous things are generated by the model. They are, they emerge from the model. Uh, they they uh, come out of the model. The model tells us about them. They are generated by its dynamics. The exogenous things are things we tell to the model. We tell the model, assume this, assume that. Sometimes it's a fixed number, like for a parameter. Sometimes it's a pre-specified assumption about how employment rate will change uh, over time or what have you. Maybe it's based on some historic data that we have and we're playing it out for some historic period where we have a, you know, a, um, some sort of known uh, occurrence of, uh, of uh, unemployment, uh, unemployment rates uh, over a 10 year period. And we put that into the model as a, as a fixed pre-specified change over time. The point is it's pre-specified. It's not generated by the model. It's not created as part of the model operation that it will generate. It. And then that final category. So those were endogenous, exogenous. And then that final category was uh, ignored or excluded. These are things, um, some of which are explicitly considered and put in the parking lot. And some of them are things that we neglect at our peril, perhaps. But um, in other cases, they, they seem so only distantly relevant or not relevant at all. We, we don't give them much thought and we leave them, uh, we leave them out entirely without um, really closely examining them. Now, over time, those divisions change. Endogenous things, um, sometimes we expand in more detail and get richer. Occasionally, endogenous things become, we say, look, um, we, we go into this, we don't need to represent it in this level of detail. This is no longer policy relevant, or this is no longer relevant for our needs, and we'll turn into just some fixed assumption. More common yet are things that are exogenous initially. Maybe it's initiation rate, and we say, let's endogenize it. Let's, per that model we created yesterday, um, let's make initiation rate endogenous. Let's turn it from a fixed number, a fixed hazard rate, a, a chance per year in this case, that someone will initiate smoking to something that depends on their peer network's characteristics and how many of their peers are smokers. And, and we go from there. And that's an example of endogenizing something that was previously exogenous, previously represented, but in a pre-specified way. So, so that division, endogenous, uh, exogenous, and ignored is uh, a key one. And it's a good lens by which to examine models that we encounter to help you understand what is this model? What is it doing? What are its assumptions? What, what is it useful for? If you can list out roughly things that are endogenous, exogenous, ignored, you'll be much further down down that pipe. Um, so, uh, a useful tool. Now, in that in that initial um, foray, I I also hit on a couple of other key distinctions. Um, and particularly, I distinguish between very stylized models, models that are are really caricatures. They're often used for theory building. They're used for building up our understanding of how perhaps just a few processes, perhaps descriptively simple, could come together and, and give rise to behavior. And we can, we can develop some better intuition, but also better confidence in, in what behaviors can come from just some simple assumptions, some simple structure. Structure determines behavior, and we're often seeking insight into what behavior is elicited from a given structure. 
Now, um, I illustrated that with a couple of models. Most of our models that we build in this boot camp and most that to which I expose you are fairly stylized of necessity because they need to be small enough to be built easily or not be overwhelming um, to people encountering modeling for the first time. That first SIR model that we built where we have those waves of infection, once we added loss of immunity that first day on Monday, Monday morning, um, that was an example of the stylized model. Yesterday, I introduced the shelling segregation model as well. And uh, that's uh, kind of a prototypical or exemplar example of a stylized model. These models are very common in the HMS modeling literature, and they can be very insightful. And sometimes we're building a larger model and we're struggling to understand some aspects of behavior for Rajma's question yesterday. And we end up going and carving out a small, simple model just to test our thinking. I remember a case of this some years back where we were working on a quite articulated model. Um, so it was a tripartite model of, um, uh, it was a, di a diabetic end stage renal disease and, and diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and 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 renal outcomes, um, including transplantation, dialysis, et cetera. And um, we were noting uh, that the model gave quite good matches to historic data when when used sort of for the status quo assumptions. Um, and we wanted to develop confidence that it was it was adequately characterizing this historic data. And there was there's one discrepancy that was troubling me. And it, it had to do, as I recall, with um, something along the lines of the number of transplants over over time. Um, and and there were some patterns in the observed data um, that weren't matching what we saw in the model. And so I built a little stylized model um, of just a few features of it um, where I could change certain basic assumptions. And that was enough to convince me that these discrepancies could readily be accounted for um, by cohort effects associated with the way the statistics were collected. It was in five-year cohorts or something. And so we'd sometimes see it go up and then see it go down as that cohort aged out. And um, and so you'd get these periods where it was higher rates um, with a certain number of individuals in there, and then it would go down and then it would go up in the next group, et cetera. In any case, the small stylized model helped confirm my understanding that the patterns you see in empirical data were in fact consistent with they were consistent with um, uh, with what could plausibly be understood with the behavior of that model, given statistical variability and the ways in which the data were created or were collected. I could see these patterns um, uh, very clearly with the small stylized model in ways that, that really helped me understand these empirical patterns. Um, so sometimes we build small stylized models um, to crystallize understanding that emerges from more complex models and 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 translate it and um, communicate it more effectively. Sometimes we build them to clarify our thinking about behavior we see in these larger models. But small stylized models often live alongside richer empirical models. So. Um, that was another component of that uh, of that first uh, lecture. I um, I also wanted to just emphasize again the iterative nature of modeling. Modeling is learning, and uh, I pulled up a set of slides that um, I will often uh, present as part of this um, uh, part of this event, where I spoke about. Uh, models as learning prostheses. Um, and uh, I'll share my screen here. Uh, I didn't share these uh, this year, but um, 
uh, you know, the argument was that models of this sort are often misunderstood, misconstrued, and and have um, uh, expectations that are both unrealistic and 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 uh, grossly off base in terms of the purpose about what dynamic modeling is. And many people mistakenly think that it's it attempts to be a crystal ball, a perfect depiction of the world. And I argued it's more like a a learning prosthesis, um, but it's a cognitive prosthesis, not one for missing leg or for a um, a broken foot, but one that's aimed at at building um, building understanding, um, allowing us to achieve something closer to full functionality than if we pursued our work in an unassisted way. Um, so these models help us, as I've mentioned several times think more robustly, more quickly, more thoroughly through and reliably um, uh, our, our theories, our, our understanding of the world. And importantly, and in a topic that will be a prominent one for much of the rest of the, the boot camp, which surfaced yesterday, they allow us to put empirical evidence to, to better use. They allow us to take that evidence not as solitudes, not different data sets, not as one-off solitudes that are that are each totally distinct, but view them instead as different aspects of an underlying system, different faces, different facets, different um, different reflections or or perspectives on an underlying system. And models, dynamic models, have this integrative nature. They bring together under a single roof, as it were, um, a representation of processes that will give rise to multiple types of output. You know, it's not like the classic regression model where you have one dependent variable or maybe a couple. Typically in a dynamic model, we'll have many different types of factors that are that are being calculated over time. We saw this yesterday when we were building up these models um, and we were putting in different outcome measures. Our outcomes here um, can be chosen quite widely often because the model is a lot of different elements that are often involved in its endogenous behavior. But the other thing that's different from most regression models and I'm, I'm hitting this to, to strengthen some distinctions introduced yesterday, is that beyond the focus on causal understanding rather than associational, um, in most regression models, the outcome variable, the, the dependent variable, uh, is something that is strictly an outcome. Whereas in dynamic modeling, we often are outputting things say the number of smokers, uh, current smokers, former smokers, never smokers, so the number of people with a healthy heart or those with heart disease, these are not just outputs and just outcomes. They're not, they're not just um, end outcomes that don't affect the rest of the model. They're involved in an element of the state of the model and they evolve, they impact how the model evolves going forward. The number of never smokers now will be important for how the model behaves over the next year, or the next two, because those individuals are at risk of starting to smoke. The number of current smokers, maybe a key outcome of interest, is shaping how many new current smokers come about in the next year to peer effects, right? They also affect what because of their ability to quit how many individuals become former smokers. It also affects how many individuals develop heart disease. So a lot of the outcomes we have from these sorts of models, like we were building yesterday, are, are outcomes. They are outputs, but they're not just outputs. They're not, they're not purely epiphenomenal. They don't they're not something which simply um, uh, exists and it doesn't affect any further evolution of the system. There are some outcomes like that we occasionally look at, but for the most part, the things we're getting out from a simulation model are 
things that are also drivers. They are symptoms and they are causes. And this is the nature of complex systems. Um, the things that we look to as symptoms also play a causative role. Um, so it is in, in many areas of life. Um, and our simulation models capture this in ways that are less standard for uh, for something you might have encountered previously, like regression filters. That, those are not the only differences. I emphasized yesterday several others with, with regression. But for anyone who thinks, who might be mistaken for thinking these models are some sort of weird, you know, uh, nonlinear form of regression, and we need to make sure that, that there's no misunderstanding of that because they're, they're not. And, you know, I argued that in terms of model evolution, um, there's this refinement process going on where we as modelers have some mental model, but it really is, I, I don't like this slide um, for several reasons, but one of them is it shows a modeler by themselves. Modeling, I argued yesterday, is from this floor, is, is a team sport. Modeling, impactful modeling happens because of interdisciplinary teams. Um, the unit of success, I articulated, is the modeling team and not the individual. Time was, uh, decades ago, where I might have said, oh, there's some ideal model or you know, prototype. And these days, um, I, I think that's a misnomer. Uh, I think it's an error in kind. I don't, I don't actually think there's a perfect modeler. I, I'd say there are good modeling teams. And, and it's really the complementarity and the ability of the team members to communicate and to, um, to effectively um, share understanding and pool knowledge and expertise from different backgrounds, from different perspectives that makes modeling powerful. And what's going on is that the mental model of modeling team members is, is um, evolving in parallel with the discoveries from modeling. And this allows the modeling to, to itself be informed by refined mental models. We build models of them. Um, here I've shown a kind of depiction crudely of a, of a network of, of agents um, that might be embedded in the network that gives rise to behavior that behavior can get compared with empirical observations and lead to our model being challenged. Um, this behavior might also lead directly to someone with lived experience, someone who's a system stakeholder, someone who works in this corner of the system or that one or that one or that one to, to respond to, to this by saying that doesn't look right or that looks unrealistic or I, I don't know why we're seeing this effect, please look into it. And that shapes our thinking about priorities and we're kind of iterating. This is a learning loop. This is the loop involved in learning, but it's not a disconnected one. We go to the external world often and collect data. And sometimes we're fortunate enough to observe the impacts of interventions in the external world. And we can use those to inform the model. And occasionally, if the model has been constructed long enough, it may inform decision-making and inform interventions, and we can test how the intervention actually seemed to affect things in the world versus what the model suggested. And we can evaluate um, drivers for that, why we see these effects from the world in the empirical data coming from the, the modeling. So modeling, ladies and gentlemen, is learning. And uh, modeling is learning at a collective level, the level of the team. Um, and a key component of that is shifting the team's thinking um, about what's going on. I will note, and as um, my esteemed colleague Sarah Metcalf will recognize, in agent-based modeling, the, the idea of a mental model traditionally has been less pronounced. This is very much um, a reflection of, of uh, my, my grounding also in system dynamics over decades. 
because there there's more explicit discussion of mental models and of uh, of the modeling process more generally. HMA's modeling has tend to have been more um, variously more technocratic for micro simulation or um, more um, more technically focused. Um, and uh, and I think only in recent, uh, the last decade has sort of started to be real attention to the modeling process. Um, so I argued that it's the modeling process rather than the models created that offer the benefit. It is modeling. If, if the model that a team is working with disappears altogether, um, if it were due to some horrible you know, loss of data, some natural disaster to disappear, the team will have still secured enormous extra understanding because of it will be far further forward because of their encounter with the model. And I held forth here yesterday that not only that, rebuilding the model would be far easier. Wade and I were discussing it after my surmises yesterday. And both of us suspect that, um, you know, if, if you were to take a model that was built up in a modeling process, maybe over many months, maybe even a year or two, through this refined process, and, and you were to tell the modeler, you know, this um, um, this model is now unavailable, you're going to have to rebuild it. Or if you were to give them that option, many of them would leap at it, and they could probably end up doing it in a small fraction of the time. Maybe it's 10% of the time, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 5%. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But the clarity that comes from that earlier modeling, the clarity that's come from testing a model in the crucible of empirical evidence and, and developing understanding from across the team and common lingo, common language, and, and that's identified the key features of the situation that need to be captured let you capture this in a fraction of the time. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's less than 10%. Uh, it's certainly consistent with what we see in software. And I think modeling is even more so because of the amount of learning that you can boil it down into a much smaller fraction of the time. So it's not that the technical artifact is terribly, terribly difficult to intricately build up. It's that what understanding is captured in that artifact um, it, it, and what, what knowledge is translated into that model um, is, is typically the model, that question. And um, the model itself is, is a vehicle that can often be built up quite quickly and in a small fraction of the time and in a much cleaner way related to Rasha's question yesterday. Um, okay, I think I'll, um, I'll go light on... on um, uh, many of these points, but I'll I'll just say, so yesterday I emphasized this relationship between model and empirical data. I stand before you as someone who is simultaneously a data scientist and a system scientist. I took my first machine learning class in 1991. Um, it was called uh, Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence at that time, um, PAMI, and and since that time, I've always been intrigued by the insights that can be secured through data. Um, but as a modeler, I recognize that empirical data represents, in a way, the shadows cast by the by the world. It's it represents whispers of this underlying situation in the world. And as a system scientist, I am committed to understanding the drivers for those patterns that we see in data. Um, data is recognized as emerging from an underlying process. There's a data generating process that often includes very human elements. Um, how that data comes about has many human elements that may need to delays, to omissions, to misstatements, to misestimates, et cetera. Um, it's subject to change. So the patterns that we see in the world, the associations, this is a very important point I didn't touch on yesterday, but the associations we see in the world between variable X and Y will be quite different 
after interventions. They result at a given time, association that we observe from the world, um, say between age and prevalence rates or between someone's um, smoking status and the probability of dying from, from heart disease will be a reflection of the current data generating process uh, to use the language of statistics, which include the underlying system that's driving. And those associations will change. If there's a big advance in, um, in uh, cardiology, or if there is a, uh, a, a change in um, preventive measures or if, uh, for, for uh, a communicable disease, or if there's uh, public health advisories issued, or if there are um, there are uh, new uh, new advances available on the vaccine front, vaccines are introduced. The association between age on the one hand and prevalence or incidence of COVID nineteen may markedly change. If people or older start to disproportionately become, you know, get vaccinated, the problems of COVID-19 can be expected to change, right? Um, the associations are contingent. It's not to say they aren't valuable. At any one time, they're super valuable. We use them all the time in our models, but we, we recognize them for their limitations, just as we recognize our models for their limitations. Uh, we recognize they're not associations born in heaven that are forever immutable like platonic solids, they are instead contingent on the underlying process. And they are not solitudes. The data we observe from the world about a given situation, the incidence of COVID-19 in each age group, the hospital admissions, non-ICU hospital admissions for people of that age group, the number of people getting vaccinated within that age group, the number of deaths of people in those age groups um, within a given period of time, uh, the number of individuals who are in the ICU right now within that age group, you know, uh, in uh, the, the, the ICU census. Those are not solitudes to each other. They're different data. I mean, you look at them in, and it's different numbers to be sure, but they're all facets of a common underlying situation. Similarly, if we're talking about type 2 diabetes, the number of people being diagnosed you know, in a given year with type 2 diabetes, the number of people who are diagnosed with chronic kidney disease um, uh, that's diabetes-related rather than uh, you know, glomerulonephritis nephritis or some other cause, um, the number of people who are who are uh, undergoing dialysis right now, um, the number of individuals passing away with diabetes, the number of individuals at each stage by their EGFR of chronic kidney disease. These are, these are common reflections of an underlying system. They're different faces of this underlying system. So we view different sets of data, not as solitudes, as a data scientist, it's very common to say, oh, look at this data set. That's really interesting. Let's dive into it. And I have that urge, but I also recognize, gosh, this data set is related to that one. It's related to that one. They're not the same. They're not just linearly related. They may, one may be kind of um, tend to be later in the process and be kind of have some lag related to other ones, et cetera. But they're coming from an underlying system that is fair. And as such, they are different facets, different perspectives on that underlying system. Um, it, all of them offer information about this common system. And so system science brings to data science a, a, a greater attention to how, where these data come from and their commonalities. And there's an emerging field of systems data science to which we contributed substantively, which, which really tries to merge these, these understandings together. I'm emphasizing this in part because in the survey, there was a lot of interest expressed in how models work with, with, with data science and with machine learning. And um, I'm just hitting on this right now. But I want to highlight this other point. This is really important. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of our use of models is to ask about counterfactuals, to ask about what if questions when we don't have data. 
we build the models and we have to develop confidence in them by challenging them with observations from the world with empirical data. We have to we have to have some reason for having a degree of confidence. Remember, they're not reducible to the data. There's a lot more expertise in the models than, than the data that goes into them. The structure is more important, but we want the model to reproduce data that we observe from the world where we have it. But a lot of our goal with the model is often to go off-road, to ask what if questions, which we, by definition, we don't have data because they are counterfactual. They are things that have yet to be observed. We might ask, suppose that we had a, a pan coronavirus vaccine, for example, that we could deploy. Or suppose that we had a mechanism by which we could, and you know, maybe maybe we're in the era where hep C medications were not covered by the province, and we're asking what if they were covered by the province going forward? Um, you know, what would the impact be? And we may be asking what if there were these therapeutic advances and made, or these public health investments made. We don't have data for those situations. So we're using the model to posit what would happen there by, by building a model that is true to the data as we've seen it thus far and asking it then what if questions. So models and empirical data have this relationship. And I use this the imperfect analogy of Plato's cave. I don't mean to downplay the value of data, uh, data but data um, whispers to us about an underlying system that is more than, than the, the data itself. It, it whispers to us about underlying drivers, about common effects that give rise to, um, to that data. So the patterns we see in data, as much as I love exploring them, as much as our lab has lots and lots of data science work going on with machine learning, computational statistics, um, we do view these as kind of whispers of, um, of an underlying person, uh, an underlying process that is dynamic, as you could see. Um, okay, um, so those are some comments. So that, that those um, bits of logic we put into that model later in the afternoon where we were reporting from the model, those are very emblematic of what we do. We put in place in a model of what are called observer processes that report. Maybe it was in those graphs. Remember those graphs we created yesterday that it graphs the prevalence over time or graphs that count of people with heart disease overall and people who had, who had um, uh, heart disease and, and never smokers and deaths, et cetera. Those are all outcomes from the model. They're not purely, they're generally reflections of the state of the model that will be driving its future evolution. So they're not purely hands-off outputs that don't affect the model. They, they, are, they are aspects of the situation, but it's very common we create lots of those so that we can compare the model outcomes with what we see empirically from the world and say like, oh, that doesn't look realistic or that, that's way off from what we see in the world or, Oh, um, that that is similar. I should also know um, that um, within the, I, I think I'll I'll come to that in the calibration phase. We we won't we won't touch about it now. I could, um, uh, it, it probably will be jumping the gun. Um, so you know, a couple take home points from the past two days that I wanted to really emphasize and um i didn't show these slides as part of this i think i posted them to the, the, the slides area I, if i haven't let me know and i'll i'll post them but um a couple real important points here that i want to make sure everyone's you know sort of understands as part of the perspective of system science addressing many foremost health problems i would say societal problem god it's a global problem so it's hard because they exhibit the features of complex systems. They exhibit surprise behavior. That's the nature of emergence. You get surprises, you get unexpected things. You poke here, it pops out there. 
you try to intervene in this area and maybe it shows a bit of effect, but you get these adverse effects out in other areas of the system. Um, dynamic modeling provides us these tools. And more broadly, the enterprise of system science provides these, these, these mechanisms, these tools to represent reason about the behavior of these complex systems. And they do that by our models representing positing hypotheses about the underlying processes in these systems, the drivers, the underlying drivers, the structure of the system. We try to capture the essential structure of the system. Much the same way a map tries to capture the essential features of the transit system enough so that you can go from any point in the city to any other point in the city. Um, models try to represent these things as best we understand them, and they are learning tools that help us shape our understanding, refine our understanding, challenge our understanding, welcome critiques and, and understanding from different perspectives that will that will help refine our collective knowledge about a situation. So these models help us understand what's going on, why we see certain patterns in the world, and how interventions might affect it. I argue that models, you know, like maps, are specific to purpose. And um, it turns out that multiple modeling types be complementary. In fact, in some cases, synergistic for describing complex systems will be coming tonight. Um, probably tomorrow or Friday. Um, models help us understand why we see patterns in data, why we see associations, why we see trends, why we see these sorts of um, patterns of oscillations or sudden growths or spikes. They help us understand where they come from mechanistically. It, you, you may have not have noticed, but when I'm interacting with the class uh, about models, I'm always asking, why are we seeing this? What's driving it? And I'm trying to build up this idea of mechanistic reason. We see this because of X, Y, or Z is often what, what we can be fruitfully thinking. We try to build an understanding of data from the world that is based on understanding of the mechanics of what's producing it and what processes are producing it. And that brings us always back to a common understanding of this system. Um, models have strong limitations, but as I observed, uh, Winston Churchill said about democracy, they may be the least bad of the known alternatives for many for many goals. Okay, um, so um, enough uh, on that front. Any discussion um, or questions or um, uh, or points for uh, for inquiry or dialogue people would like to put put forward now. Any any things that you know are you're you're seeking to better understand or you're seeking to uh, put in put in perspective? How about uh, online folks? Maybe I'll, I'll I'll offer online folks first, uh, just because we have such. Um, uh, such uh, direct contact with folks here. Anyone from online want to put something forward for discussion? Anyone? Hey, I'm not hearing anyone there. How about in the in the classroom? Anyone want to proffer any thoughts, any ideas, any comments? I, just in terms of mechanistic reasoning, yeah, like really to get. I mean, that's probably where I'm struggling a yeah. lot. Yeah, you know, even when I think about doing realist understand what right. that mechanism is right how you pull that out of the literature how you're yeah how you really identify like, so anything more you can say on how to build that as a skill yeah um thank you so so for those who didn't hear it up here uh wendy had um had noted that um uh while she 
uh, she's uh, familiar with elements of the uh, realist literature on the value of mechanistic thinking. Um, are there any tips or suggestions I might have on how to build build that skill of thinking mechanistically? And I I have to say that I think this is one of the um, challenges that it's arguably the foremost challenge I see when people who are coming from the health sciences uh, encounter these techniques, not just in boot camps, but also like in my lab, et cetera, just to learn to approach um, issues by, in terms of thinking about why we're seeing these things, what, what, um, uh, what interaction of pathways might be, might be underlying the behavior we see or the, the, the properties we see in these systems, um, their resilience or their lack of resilience, et cetera. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say some things that are trite to the point of being platitudes, but, um, but maybe, maybe they offer us some value. Um, one thing I'll say is that learning by doing here is, is important. So like, trying your hand at something. But it's more than that. I I think it's important in these regards to not, got, not get caught up in kind of, uh, I'll give you some fancy terms, but orthopraxy and kind of um, and formalism. So what I mean by that is it's, it's not a matter of doing it only in one framework. You know, you'll have to use stock and flow diagrams to do it. You have to use safe charts. You have to use... Um, it's a street event simulation workflows. It, I think I think for a lot of students starting out in this area, um, there's um, there's several layers of barriers because to articulate an idea mechanistically, it's often done in the context of articulating a model where you also start to run into issues with like the software and the you know, needing to. To, to do a bit of coding or something or needed to, to draw it in just the right way. And, and what I find is causal loop diagrams um, uh, and their variants. And I'm, I'm, I wanna emphasize uh, that it's important to, I think it's valuable to put aside some of the strict rules, like the strict causal loop diagramming tradition and, and try your hand a bit more fruitfully to just sketch things out. I find a lot of my students from any background, uh, when they first come to causal loop diagrams, they have, um, uh, th th they run into a set of uh, barriers for articulating them and they get better over time. They, they develop a skill, they develop a strength with it that, um, that takes time to build up. And they can get really, really good at it. Um, so two weeks ago, I, I mentioned we were in LA and, and we spent a couple of days building up this cause loop diagram, but it wasn't a strict cause loop diagram. Um, it was it was a little bit loosey, um, uh, just to be able to capture the ideas and thoughts and recognizing, well, we can go back and probably tidy this up. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll be a bit loose with kind of how we put them together. And so if that's helpful, we'll show you know, A is influencing A, A is influencing B and C um, more as as definitionally rather than just causally A, you know, changes things in B and B and C. Maybe we'll just say A is, is, is uh, yields, it means either B is true or C is true. And, and in any case, I, I don't get caught up in that. We, we try to avoid getting caught up in the, in the kind of, um, rules of causal loop diagramming. And I found that whole exercise extremely helpful for our students that we had. And I've led uh, quite a few of these exercises over my decades with stakeholders of various sorts. And they and it really helps them after spending a few hours and maybe going through a few of these exercises, you can get a lot, a lot more skilled and, and kind of thinking mechanistically and then being able to articulate it effectively. So I would say starting with 
loose adherence to a traditional like causal diagramming and iterating is one of the best ways to develop these strains. I'm working with a colleague um, in the US right now, who's just getting uh, started in the system science role uh, um, road. And she and I are iterating on a causal diagram. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and actually she has some stocks and flows in it too. And um, I'm, I'm seeing huge growth in her ability to articulate things um, with time and feedback from me, et cetera. And I, I find the same thing is true with students. So, and, and I think that's the level of kind of facility that's helpful for thinking mechanistically, being able to sketch out diagrams just gets those, those neurons firing about like how to describe this in terms of um, the pathways to effect, what is driving what. You, you develop that skill through causal loop diagramming, um, I think, quite quickly in a way that avoids a lot of the pitfalls and stumbling blocks if you try to use, you know, formal um, modeling software uh, to do that. And I, I think you'll find that builds a lot of strengths. Yeah. Uh, others, though, who'd like to put things through or forward as well. Questions? Anything? Okay, well, um, I think we will, and let's see, it's 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 about, um, so we've been going for a little bit under an hour. So um, does anyone, uh, would anyone like to take a five minute break and, uh, and then resume? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing some nodding. So yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll be back. Let's say we'll be back at 9.30 and we'll get started here. Okay, so it'll be seven minutes.